Well, Bob, we'd like to welcome you here today. And what we'd like you to do is tell us your name and who you are and what you do, and when you came to Redondo Beach for the first time, and the history of your life here, and, and the things that you've done, and you've done quite a bit, especially in the area of surfing and diving and boats. Yeah. Well, my name is Bob Maestro. I was born in Boonville, Missouri in 1928. I have a twin brother that I've been in business with for all these years. And uh, the unique thing is he was born on July the 30th, and I was born on July the 31st. So he's a day older than I am every day of the year, and then one day of the year he's a year older than I am, so I give him a bad time on his birthday. Uh, we came out to Redondo in 1943 or 44, right? And uh, we, we came to Manhattan Beach, actually, and we went to Redondo Union High School for two and a half years. And then we wanted to swim for uh, Yuho Sari over there in El Segundo, so we switched schools. And I'd met my wife over there, my girlfriend. And uh, so um, we, we, in Missouri, we played around with um, diving and stuff. We made our own diving helmets when we were four, uh, 13 or 14, and we dove in lakes and streams. And it's so wonder we didn't get killed. When we came out here, we bought a real beautiful diving helmet. And uh, my mom said, we were painting it up, and my mom says, how come they sold it to you so cheap? And we said, well, the guy di died in it, and he did. They forgot to put a check valve in it, and so we dove all over the breakwaters. And so when we got here, the breakwater was just very, very small in Redondo. You know, you had to launch your boat over the, over the sand and everything. And in Missouri, we made three goals. We wanted to be deep sea divers, and we wanted to own a submarine, and we wanted to go treasure hunting, and we did all those. I've owned four submarines. I have, we have two now, and I'm in business with a guy that has has built his own submarines and we've do a lot of diving with those and we went up and discovered a treasure and that was successful and I've been on three treasure hunts so that's we're equaled out on that I didn't make any money but I haven't lost any money either and uh, we um, we uh, went to El Segundo graduated from there and um, I came from a family of seven children and my dad got killed when I was four so my mom raised all seven of us by herself and so when we got to be 18 or 19, we just went out and, and said we're going to be on our own, and we started starting working, so there was no th thought of going to college. Um, I, I was going through all, all, everything in my mind of everything we did, and I had 26 jobs before I was 16 years old. And uh, I never got fired, but I always found a better job where I made more money, and it's kind of a shame that people, uh, young kids today don't... Uh, I think it builds a good work ethic for you, and they just don't do that. But uh, then we went in the Army, and then when we came back, we, uh, we were surfers and surfed all up and down the coast of California and, and uh, did a little bit of diving. And in Santa Cruz, where I was at, I was at Fort Ord, it, it was, diving was out of the question because it was so cold and everything, but I did surf at night by car light with a wool sweater on. And so we came back down here, and the surfing was so crowded, I took up diving, and... Uh, um, the way we got into the business, my brother had been, my uh, brother was uh, engaged right before he went to Korea, and I was already married. And um, a guy stole his fiance while he was in Korea, and he barred my surfboard. And his name was Be Beverly Morgan. And so when I got out of the service, I thought, a guy named Beverly, we can beat him up. That's a sissy name. <laughs> Next thing I know, we went into business with him, and the three of us built Dive and Surf. And then uh, he got out in 1958, he got a divorce, and we paid his alimony, went around the world, and then um, uh, we just kept getting a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger, and Body Glove came along, and that's all over the world now. So, Bob, what year did you, again, did you come to Redondo Beach? I can't remember. It was 43 or 44, I think it was. And how old were you? Uh, let's see. Figured out somebody. <laughs> I was born in 1928, and I think uh, uh, we About were 14? 14 or 15 when we got here. So Maybe 15, I think it was, yeah. So when you got here, did uh, your parents put you right into Redondo yeah, High School? Yeah, went right into Redondo Beach High School. We, we came from a small Catholic school. There were 250 people in the whole school. And uh, there was one year that uh, the nun had uh, three sets of twins in one class of 12 or 13 kids. 
We drove her crazy. <laughs> and this was in the Catholic school? Catholic then. school. Don't you see my knuckles? <laughs> that was, was in Missouri? Uh, yeah, I just hated, I hated the nuns. I just, uh, you know, they were, they were on my list. And when we came to California, my mom would invite them out to spend vacations at our house in the summertime. So we always had two nuns at our house every summer from the old school back there. But and they were where, great. Was, where was the first house that you moved into? In uh, we moved into um, on uh, Highland Avenue, on uh, 1031 Highland Avenue in Manhattan, in Manhattan Beach. Yeah. I think it's 31st Street it was or something like that. And then um, we moved down to um, Highland Avenue and uh, right next to the Catholic Church in Manhattan, right off Pier Avenue. I think it's 13th Street. And we lived there. And then when I got married, I, I bought, uh, went in the Army and I came back and rented a house. And then I bought a house. Uh, on uh, Elm Street, and my brother was kind of my older brother was kind of dabbling in uh, real estate at the time. He owned Mr. Johnny's five and ten cent store in Manhattan Beach, and um, he got into real estate a little bit. And he sold me a house in Redondo. And man, everybody just criticized me. He said, "You can't afford that. You can't afford that." And we couldn't. You know, the payments were one hundred and sixty-five dollars a month, and I paid twenty-eight thousand five hundred dollars for it. And uh, uh, we didn't have any furniture in the front room for the first five years. We had sheets over the windows. <laughs> we were the bums in the neighborhood. And uh, and where was that house? That's on um, the, um, 413 Via Pasquale. I've been lived there since 1960. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and it's worth a lot of money now. And I bought my wife wanted. To, a bigger house when we got to making a little money, so I bought her the house next door. <laughs> then she wanted a view, so I bought her the boat. <laughs> so it satisfied her all the way around. So when you when you first came here, uh, you said they had 26 jobs before you were 16. Yeah. Uh, what were some of those jobs, and where did you do them? Well, I was a butcher, almost cut my thumb off, and I kept getting colds from going in and out of the freezer. And where were you a butcher? At what in store? in, in uh, Missouri, at, okay. at some market there. And I made ice cream, I delivered milk, I, I was a pin setter at the bowling alley. We lifeguarded at the pool, cleaned everything up, and they allowed us to go in the pool year-round, well, in the summertime. Uh, I shoveled snow, cut grass. I remember we, uh, I was coming home one day, and there's a real old man, older than I am now, and he was stacking this cord and a half of wood out there. And I said, I'd like to do that for you. And he says, well, what do you charge me? I said, anything you want. And so he's, all right, get at it. So I put big logs and then small ones and, and then smaller ones so he could just take them off there and he didn't have to dig through the pile. And I did a beautiful job. It took me about two and a half hours to do it. I called him and knocked on the door and I said, I'm finished. And he says, how much owe you? And I says, anything you'll give me, I'll be satisfied with. So he gave me a nickel. And nickel was a lot, a lot of money in those days because mm -hmm. you could buy the biggest hamburger in town. I mean, at, at this little green uh, cafe for a nickel. I used to go up there for 50 cents and buy 10 hamburgers, fed the whole family. So I said, thank you, and I walked away. And he says, son, come back here. And I says, yeah. And he says, are you happy with that nickel? And I said, I'm never going to work for you again. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me $5, which was a lot of money. If, you could, if we could save $25 in the summertime, my mom would match it. In the, huh. Anything we saved in the summertime, she'd match it in our bank account that we mm -hmm. put in the money and save. So uh, I worked for him for a long time. And one reason I didn't want to leave Missouri because I had a great job with him. You know, he called me up and said, we need some drugs from the drugstore. Go get us some milk at the market. And, and they paid me handsomely after that because mm -hmm. he found out I was a pretty nice kid. But um, we just uh, learned to take care of ourselves and do things and appreciate what we had. When you came to Manhattan Beach um, and you lived there, did you have much occasion to come down to Redondo Beach? Yeah, well, we came down here all the time, but I never did see the plunge. I, I think it had just been destroyed when we were here, but we, I saw the boardwalk, you know, and they had the wrestling down there and the roller derby, and we went to all those things, and the breakwater hadn't been finished or anything. And um, um, we went to school here, so we, we were in Redondo a lot. So what can you tell me about the wrestling? The wrestling, oh, the wrestling, you know, we, yeah. we, we thought it was great, you know, G Gorgeous George and all those guys, <laughs> it was kind of... Where did they wrestle? Uh, they had a, a, a great big kind of thing right on the boardwalk there, and you went in, it held hundreds of people there, it's it it spectacular. And so they, did they have a ring with the ropes? And yeah, sure, uh -huh. and yeah. then they had roller derby too there. Well, we heard from one person that the roller derby was all wood floors with skates with wood wheels. And that once they started rolling around, that it was really loud. I, and it was doing? loud, and I didn't know it was wooden wheels. I didn't know that. Uh, but that's possible, yeah. And so what did you do? Uh, so how old were you 
uh, you graduated, you left Redondo because you were swimming. Yeah. Did you swim at Redondo too? Uh, yeah, we swam. We, I remember we went in and we talked to Mel Seifert and uh, Ewells, I think his name was, and they were the coaches there. And we wanted to get seventh period gym. And they said, well, you don't get that unless you're a really good athlete and everything. And he, so he said, why don't you come down to the pool and try out? And if you're a good swimmer, he says, have you, had any, have you been to any swim meets or anything? So we joined the Boy Scouts every year to swim for them. And we, we were pretty good. So we went down and we beat everybody in the pool. And so we got seventh period gym. <laughs> but uh, they, they, we uh, worked out. Our, our, uh, our pool was the Hermosa gym. That's where Hermosa plunge. And we didn't have a plunge at Redondo. And so we go over to El Segundo, and my sister lived over there, and so we'd use her address to get in the pool. And sorry, he'd come down and say, out, you don't live in El Segundo. So we got a bad foot start with him. He just, uh, he knew we were lying. <laughs> and we did the same thing in Palos Verdes. We used to find somebody's address and get in that saltwater plunge up there and have a ball, and they, out, you don't live in Palos Verdes. But then we decided to go to El Segundo. Well, you couldn't go out for football unless you were a freshman and started with that team. That's They wanted to build the future, and mm -hmm. we came out here as a sophomore, so we were out of the deal. So El Segundo really needed football players, so we went over there and played for them, and uh, we wanted to swim for Sari, and I'd also met my girlfriend over there. So there were about so, five of us who went over there. Well, no, there's four of us, Don Kuhlman and Chuck Riley and my brother and I. And so we made, all made the team because it was a very small school and they didn't have very, we made the B's, not the A's. And the first game, first tackle, first play, I broke my back. I crushed a vertebrae. And I walked off the field and it was hurting like heck. And I was sitting on the, the bench and um, the doctor came down and says, you're okay, you can go in in second quarter. And, and I fainted and fell off the thing into a sawdust pit. And a friend of mine, Chuck Riley, came down. His brother was a professional football player. And he says, you're not moving. And they uh, didn't have a backboard or anything. So he put me on a, a board bench and strapped me on with sweatpants and took me up. And then I went to the hospital. And the doctor came in and said, there's nothing wrong with you. I checked the x-rays personally, and there's nothing wrong with you. And you can go home in three days. They want to keep me under observation. And so... I was up walking around and picking up things, but I didn't bend my back because it hurt so bad. I had 50% compression of one of the vertebrae. And so uh, the doctor came in, I had all my clothes on, my mom was there, and he was going to examine me before I went home. And he says, you can't go home. And I said, why? And he said, well, we're going to put you in a cast from head to toe. You've got a crushed vertebrae. And somebody misread the x-rays, and my mom says, you told us you read the x-rays. Out of here. She, she'd been used to firing people and getting mad and everything because she was a businesswoman after my dad got killed. She kind of took over what he was doing. So um, I just had to lay on my back for six weeks, and, and it took me five weeks to learn how to walk, and then I went back to school. And you went back to school at El Segundo. Yeah, and then we swam. And... Uh, uh, sorry, would would turn over his grave, you know, but I'd, uh, we were going to try to win this meet, and uh, we didn't think we had a good enough team, so we decided I, Bill would swim the first first two laps, and he'd run down and dry off, and I'd get in the shower and come up wet, and then he'd swim the last two laps, because I had to push off from the bank. I couldn't dive. And this well, is because just, you and your brother are identical yeah, twins? Yeah, yeah. So did and, it work? Oh, yeah, it worked, but we won by such a huge margin, it didn't make any difference anyhow, yeah. And so you could actually switch, and one of you could swim. Oh, yeah, he went to classes for me and always failed because he'd never tell me what was going on. He'd get caught talking. And he'd say, you have to write a 500-word essay, and and, I, and then she, she'd say, uh, Mr. Pelsey, where's your essay? And I said, I don't know anything about an essay. <laughs> You're supposed to write an essay. It's kind of funny. So you swam on the same swim team. Yeah. Did you play mm -hmm. football together? Uh, yeah, he went on and play, played Redondo many, many times and, and stuff like that. And uh and we graduated, and we, we went one semester to Compton and swam for them, and we were the... For Compton High School? Yeah. And El Segundo, we were the junior nationals uh, champion for... Junior nationals for the United States. We swam against UCLA, USC, Crystal Plunge, LA Athletic Club, Michigan State, Ohio, and everything. We won this, uh, the juniors, and we got second in the seniors. And it never had been d uh, done before where a high school team had uh, swam. And we went in the Army. We both got drafted. I couldn't join the Army because I had a broken back. So Bill says, well, I, I don't think they're going to draft us. He got his draft notice. And then and my doctor said, ah, you'll never make it in the Army. They're, gonna, they're not going to take you. And they and just said, what year was that that they... Uh, they 1950 and the uh, Korean War. And they just said, you're warm, you're breathing, you're in. So <laughs> once I got in, it's hard to get out. And uh, I suffered a lot because of the cold weather at Santa Cruz. 
because I could surf and everything, and I was a good lifeguard and everything like that, but I just couldn't stand the cold weather in the barracks and stuff, you know. And so after a hospital stint there of, of uh, bad backs and stuff, I finally made it through basic training, and I spent my whole career there in the Army right there. At Santa Cruz? Yeah. yeah well, Mon Monterey. Monterey. I hit like back and forth to Santa Cruz every, every day, and I'd surf by car light up there at night with a wool sweater on. It was kind of neat. So when you were uh, when you came here as a teenager, what did you know about George Freeth and the whole surfing legend of Rondo? Well, I didn't know that until I became a lifeguard in '47, and um, I'd heard of him and everything, and not I didn't know too much about him. And we we did a little surfing and stuff, and we were probably the smallest lifeguards I ever had at that time. But I worked. Uh, I think 12 years as a recurrent guard and a permanent lifeguard. I ran the call car, call car at out, out of Redondo, the emergency vehicle, and I worked every station they had. That was my fame. I'd worked every tire on the beach, clear up to Zuma. I just worked Zuma one day. But uh, So you you did everything from Palos Verdes yeah. and Rat Beach yeah. all the way up to up Zuma? To, to Man Manhattan Beach uh -huh. and, El, and El Porto. I was a permanent lifeguard at El Porto there. I had a great a great time there. I used to get up and um, right after I got in the army, we didn't have any money, and I had one child. We had a son, and I'd get up at 4:30 in the morning and go down and no, I'd get up at 3:30 in the morning, go down and you know where Poncho's is. Yes. It was a Chinese restaurant at the time, and I'd go in and have my breakfast. They allowed me to do that, and then they'd clean the whole restaurant. Take me four hours, and then Jack James, the owner, would come down, and we'd have a cup of coffee together, and then I'd go down and surf for an hour, and at 9 o'clock I'd be a lifeguard from 9 to 5, and I'd come home, play with the wife and kids, and then I'd go clean floors in the evening. I had Lee's Fashions and Bentley's and places like that in Manhattan Beach that I'd go and clean the floors in the evening. I made pretty good money the first, the first year I was out of the, the Army. Mm -hmm. How much time did you spend in Redondo as a lifeguard at the towers uh, here? Well, I spent um, a lot of time at, at uh, Avenue C and Torrance Beach and Sapphire. And it, was C the, the call car? Is no, that where they the did call that? car was out of Hermosa. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, do you remember any particular rescue more than anything else? Of one well, there was had? one. Uh, I worked at the breakwater in Redondo one time with Bill Stenham. And he, was a, he was a lieutenant. He ran the whole lifeguard service, just one lieutenant. And we were working there. And uh, we were sitting inside. It was kind of a overcast day and we I heard somebody yell for help and he heard it too and we ran out. He had the longest legs you ever saw him. He about six foot four. And so he could have almost walked out there. And I, I decided I couldn't get out there in time. And we saw a kid bobbing up and down that water yelling for help. And so the boat had just pulled in on the beach and parked and I just grabbed the boat and shoved it out, turned it around, I said, Take me out there as a kid drowned and the guy started the motor up and we went right out there and I, so on the way out I says, and there's a long ways, you know, it's a good quarter of a mile. And I says, uh, when when we get out there I'm gonna dive off the front of the boat and don't you turn this way. You, he said, I know how to do that. I'm gonna turn the other way so I won't hit you with a propeller. And he did. And I dove in the water. I beat Stenham there by far. And I grabbed the kid and I couldn't lift him. And he had another kid, he had a hammer lock on the kid and he was trying to hold him up. And so I got him away from that kid and got him and I just, I was facing him and I just squeezed him real hard, you know. And he just threw up in my face, but he started breathing, you know, and, and yelling. And so then Bill Stenham arrived and we, we got both of them. The other kid was exhausted too, but Bill, Bill saved him and I got the other kid underneath. That happened twice to me in, in Capitola up in Santa Cruz. Uh, there's a little girl, my wife and I, and, and um, the uh, Robbie were sitting on the beach, and it's a nice place, and they had a little, called the river mouth, and they, the water flowed down the river, and then had it dammed up, but they had a, a drain there. And the lifeguard was there, and apparently he never worked there, and I heard a kid yelling for help, and I thought, why didn't they dive in there? So I, I go out, <laughs> I'm in there, and went out, and I tried to lift this little girl and couldn't lift her and she had her her sister she was holding on to her like this and i got them both in and the guy said well i didn't know anything but right where that drain was it was deep water every place else was real shallow water so i had two of those in my lifetime wow yeah so when you uh when you're a garden redonda did they ever have boats uh dories that they used or was it all yeah they, and they, what they, kind I, of board did you use or flotation device well you used, used, used a regular paddle board for long rescues and we used a, a can an aluminum can they had plastic ones now and uh you use those and you're never supposed to go on the water without that can well i was coming back from breakfast one morning at uh um this avenue h they had a, re uh, a little 
uh, restaurant there. And so I was walking down to Avenue C to go lifeguarding, and I heard these guys start yelling. And they were at the uh, Rat Beach, that big rip they have there. It's a pretty famous rip. So I ran down there and jumped in. And uh, 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 no, I, uh, I jumped in. I got one guy that was close to shore. I brought him in. And then Dwight Crumb showed up, Captain Crumb. And he threw me a can because he saw that I didn't have a can. And we swam back out. And he got a guy, and I got a guy. And the fourth guy went back out to get. And he was standing on the boat. And he had a, he had a cast on his arm. And he just made the side of the cross and dove in. <laughs> and so he got on me, and he just climbed up the, the rope and, and got me. And so when I came up, I kind of hit him with the can to keep him away from me because you've got to protect yourself. I don't, I don't survive. He doesn't survive. And we took about three of them to the hospital, but we saved him that, that morning. So what was the restaurant in Redondo Beach at Avenue H? The Wayfair, I think it was. Yeah. And what was that like? It was, it was a pretty nice little restaurant. Was that a place where you'd eat breakfast there? Yeah, we'd eat yeah. breakfast there. And I didn't go there for lunch or anything because I just ate breakfast there in the morning. So were you, would you consider yourself one of the first of the modern age lifeguards in L.A. County? No, I, there, were, there were a lot before. of guys before me, yeah. So is that where, the, I've always heard them call those plastic things they can, and it came because it mm -hmm. was actually an aluminum? Yeah, an aluminum can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, they were pretty, they were heavier than these ones now. And, and we also had a rubber one, but uh, that came along a few, few years later before I quit. And uh, what year did you get married? Uh, night, you're asking me, <laughs> 1950. So, because yeah. I'm asking, because yeah. what year did you get into surfing? Uh, we got into surfing as soon as we came to California. We started buying surfboards. In stuff. 1943, they were still surfing. Well, no, it was probably 1945, 46 when we started surfing. And uh, what kind of surfboard did you have then, and who made them? Well, we we usually uh, 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 sometimes we made our own. I, I made one, and we were always running in the pier and pearl diving. They called it, and it break the nose off so we went up to Thalco plastic and we found the new fiberglass plastic so we put fiberglass on there and we'd bring this thing out and we it's sun cured residency and as soon as you get in the sun it just in five minutes and we'd forget and leave it out there and the brush would just freeze up in there and so you'd have to get another gallon and start over but we were one of the first ones to fiberglass the nose of our boards. And where did you surf in Redondo? Surfed in, well, I surfed uh, in, uh, in El Porto. I surfed there every day almost, but I surfed uh, uh, the breakwater, and I surfed Avenue C, and I did a lot of um, belly boarding. Um, uh, well, they, that's what we call them, little belly boards. You put them in your belly, and you just go back and forth, and they had some too long fins, and that's more exciting, actually, than surfing because the wave's much bigger when you're laying down on it. And I surfed Torrance Beach, and... Um, uh, Manhattan Beach, the pier, Hermosa Beach, the pier, and I surfed San Ofre, and uh, I went to Windensea a couple of times, and Malibu I surfed. One yeah. of the things we asked is, do you, did you ever surf inside the pier or shoot the pier? Oh, yeah. Yeah, at night, too. And what was that like? <laughs> that was kind of exciting, yeah. Really now, exciting. So did you surf outside and then go through it? Yeah, we, well, in big waves, uh, you, you could surf all the way, you know, catch them almost at the end of the Manhattan Beach Pier and surf in, and then you'd go through the, uh, through the pier and come back on the other side. Yeah. And what do you, uh, who were the big names in surfing then, and did you did you surf with these guys? There that, wasn't any you know, real big names in surfing, like uh, Dale Velzi was at the pier in Manhattan Beach, and we, mm -hmm. when we lived in Manhattan Beach, and I, I was guard there. And uh, Greg Knoll was a little bitty kid, and... Uh, my brother sold him his first surfboard, and uh, he got in trouble underneath the pier, and I jumped off in shallow water and saved his life. And uh, we used to put him in a trash can, because he was a little bitty guy at the time, and we, they had a, they had a, uh, you spin it, and it locked, and we wouldn't let him out of there. And my wife had come down, she felt sorry for him, she, she let him out of there. And uh, but we surfed with Jacobs and Dale Velzi, Bing, and all those guys. Now, did your your wife ever have an interest in surfing? Yeah, you? she surfed at one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you ever do the two on a board? Yeah, we, up in Santa Cruz, we I had, I had a pretty big board, and we we did that a couple of times. So, is it the cold water of Santa Cruz that made you decide to do something for a wet? Well, surf? I wanted to build something that would keep you warm. Boy, listen, it was cold up there. I mean, you had to be an idiot to go in the water. <laughs> And we didn't even think about white sharks, you know. They're scared to death up, up there. I used to go, uh, I'd take Patty and Robbie, and we'd go down to the pike in, in Santa Cruz, and I'd build a fire, and we'd, we'd have a picnic on the beach, and I'd paddle right out the river mouth there, the San Lorenzo River, I think it is, 
and I'd go around the corner and I always took some anchovies out there with me and there's a little seal and I'd feed him and I'd catch a nice wave there. There's the only guy surfing, you know. And a seal would jump on that board and ride all the way to the beach with me. I, I bought a 19-foot slot board from uh, Belzey. He could sell an icicle to Eskimo. <laughs> and he sold that to me. It was $75. It was all the money I had. Took it up there, and I just hated it. But I, I, it was a nice board, so I wanted to ride it. And um, it's a Simmons slot board. And it has a round nose and has a square tail with two fins on it. It has two slots on the side. And my art dealer just came back from a show about a year or two ago, and uh, he stopped in, and they had a surfboard expedition. An ex exhibition. So he said, a friend of mine's got a slot board. Uh, what's a slot board? It's a Simmons slot board. And he said, the gal says, is it an original? And she said, yeah. He bought it in 19, it was made in 1947. He bought it in 1950. He says, it's worth $100,000. So I, I still have that. And Greg Noel kind of made me mad. He copied it. And uh, he says, well, uh, you know, it's not your board. I said, but it is my board. I didn't design it or anything. You have no right to copy it. And I says, if that picture of, uh, I bought from Phil Roberts, a friend of yours, I said, I took it down to a frame shop and uh, to get the frame fixed, and he made 50 copies, I'd throw him in jail. And so he's made two or three copies. I bought one of them from him. So uh, you have a son named Robbie, and did you teach him how to surf? A uh, little bit, yeah. In Santa Cruz, I time surf, yeah. We Did he ever the... have any interest in lifeguarding, too, or anything like no, that? No, none of them. None of them. I got one grandson that's a, beach, uh, that's a pool lifeguard. He's, he's a character. I had three sons, Robbie, Ronnie, and Randy. And when they'd get their hair real long, I'd name them Sandy, Susie, and Sarah. <laughs> they didn't get their hair long, very long. <laughs> so when, you, uh, when you're in Redondo and as a teenager uh, and before you joined the Army, what did you do for fun? Well, we um, we surfed mostly, and and, uh, and we did did snorkeling a little bit. We used to catch some pretty good lobster snorkeling and stuff. But uh, we went to shows, and uh, uh, when I met my wife, I tried to uh, I tried to find a gal that didn't smoke or didn't drink. I didn't like smoking. I didn't like drinking. The experience about drinking, uh, we were on a farm uh, hunting one day, and we weren't supposed to be, and uh, we saw this big cloud of d dust, and we went running over there, and it was about half a mile away. And our best friend was a guy named John King in town, and his dad had, was delivering cement, and he was just drunker and a skunk. And uh, he had ran into our next-door neighbor who had five children, and she was laying in the ditch with her shoulder torn off, and she didn't have a scratch on her body. And I just remember seeing that lady laying there, and here's five kids that aren't going to have a mother, and a husband's not going to have a wife, and I just made up my mind, I'm never drinking. And uh, after my dad got killed, my mom remarried 10 years later, and he became an alcoholic and stole everything we owned. I mean, just wiped out the whole family fortune. Mm -hmm. And the guy that killed my dad wiped out our fortune, too. And my mom turned it around and just, she wanted to be something and have a nice family, and we did. So all seven kids have turned out pretty good, except Billy and I. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I just made up my mind. I've never, I've never sm smoked a cigarette. I've never drank a beer in my life. I've never had a drink on my boat in my whole life, not even on, at the dock. I won't do it because I'm in charge, and I won't drive a car within eight hours of having a drink. So I drink at my own home. I, the doctor says, have you know, something, a drink in the, in the evening, and I like, kind of like pina colada, so my wife makes me one of those. But it's not a big deal for me. So in Redondo, did you ever go dance? Did I know guys may not look at dancing as being something, but it's, it's a prerequisite. Usually, I'm to, a terrible uh, dancer. I hate to dance. I dance once with my wife and nobody else. <laughs> so no matter you know, how good you're look, good looking you are, I'm not dancing. I'm dancing once with my wife. Just say we would dance tonight. But we used to go to Pat Mars and we used to go to the show and uh, and a high spot was a place we hung out too. So what was Pat Mars? It was a uh, drive-in where everybody drove in and the, the gals come out and wait on you while you were sitting in the car. There. And where was that? That was on uh, Imperial Boulevard and Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, in Inglewood? In, uh, in El Segundo. El Segundo. El Segundo, yeah. And then uh, you talked about the high spot, which is in Hermosa Beach it, at it the used, top. Yeah, at, at Gould, Gould, and, and, Gould and Pacific Coast Highway. Yeah. And uh, what year were you there? Uh, about nineteen fit uh, about nineteen forty seven to uh, to uh, nineteen fifty. Now, do you remember the story about the Redondo Beach policeman being shot there? Uh, yeah, I heard by I, the Hermosa Beach officer. Uh, no, I didn't remember that one. Huh? Was he killed? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. No, was, I don't remember that. I remember John Lowe at El Segundo. They they faked a robbery there, and they 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 shot a guy with a starting pistol, and they, three of them jumped, and he fell down and laid in the street. 
and they took off and the LC Gundo cops followed them and they knew who they were and everything. They pulled them over and it was a prank they did at Pat Marcy. Wow. Terrible situation. <laughs> they really got in trouble over there. So, what do you remember at the high spot? What did people do there? Was it a? Oh, it's just a place to hang out. And meet, huh? Was it a donut shop or was it a, like a? a well, I think it was. A, it was sandwiches? a. They serve hamburgers and stuff there. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, were you? I, mostly uh, Pat Mars is where we all went. We all hung out there, you know, after school or after a movie or something. We, we'd go to a movie. I, I'm going to tell you my my criteria on a gal is if she didn't smoke or didn't drink. See. And so we went together for four years with, before we got married. And in those days, you had to marry them to sleep with them. You know? <laughs> and so my, my wife came from a family of four girls, and her, her, her uh, dad was an uh, Indian, and he was an alcoholic. And she's part Indian, so you don't want to get her on the warpath. But anyhow, and uh, alcohol was kind of a bad situation in her family. And neither one of us had a father or a grandfather, but we had fantastic mothers and, and grandmothers. And so uh, I, wanted to marry, I wanted to marry a gal that didn't smoke or didn't drink, and I found her. So we got married, and I got drafted in the Army, and she started smoking. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't kiss her for 15 years. And she finally quit smoking, and I started kissing her, and she started drinking. <laughs> she drinks a little bit. She has a good time. So... Um when you were a, as a couple, what would you do in Redondo Beach? Oh, we'd go to the show and um, what theaters? Uh, we've heard stories about the Capitol and the. Fox well, there was theater. a Strand down here, right, in, right in Redondo. And what was the Strand like? Uh, it was just normal theater, you know. And uh, the El Segundo had a very, very small little theater over there, and we went to uh, Inglewood to go to a show too. Now, did you do? Were you uh, too old, or were you about the age where they did a lot of cruising? And did you ever do that on? Hollywood no, or? I I already had a girlfriend, so I didn't do that. You had a girlfriend yeah. and a, and a, probably a son soon. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. what else uh, did you do for fun? We um, let's see, memories are going real fast. We just sp spent time together and had a lot of fun. We uh, we'd go to swim meets and we'd all. Patty was a good swimmer. She did synchronized swimming, and Billy and I and Pat and another gal were synchronized swimmers. And before the meet, we'd put on a nice little show, synchronized swimming. Nothing like they do today, but you know it was pretty pretty good at the time. And um, we'd just hang out, you know. And what pools would you do your synchronized swimming? In El Segundo and um, uh, different pools when we go, went to swim meets and stuff like mm -hmm. that. We went to Portuguese Bend a couple of times before it went in the ocean. Yeah. So what do you remember about, uh, say, the different parts of Redondo Beach when we talked to the two, two of the twins before? They talked about um, the main streets in Redondo, North Redondo were uh, Grant and Slauson. Yeah. And mm -hmm. a lot of dirt roads, a lot of farms. Do you yeah. remember any oh, of that? Oh, sure, yeah. My wife lived on, uh, I think it was Voorhees out there. And uh, my best friend is living in, a, he built a house on where she used to live. And um, we, we just... Uh, we went to, uh, the guys all went to the wrestling and the roller derby. The gals didn't like that. But we'd go to a show that would be a typical evening and go and have, have something to eat afterwards. And so was the roller derby the kind where they went around and knocked each other yeah, off the track? Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What were the best? Was that the Thunderbirds, or the, do you remember? Yeah, the there were team? Thunderbirds. Um, God, there was a red Ad Adair was a big guy in those days, and he was the top roller derby. And m another one of my friends was a roller derby guy, and he, he knows all those guys. He's got... Worst knees you ever saw in your life. Now you can't already walk from that. So how did you end up with the body glove and here in Redondo Beach? Well, we, we, um, uh, when we got out of the service. We were going to beat Morgan up, and, and we went into business with him. He and Hap Jacobs had started uh, Dive and Surf, and uh, Jacobs' dad kind of funded the thing. And um, uh, it just didn't work out. There wasn't uh, They weren't selling enough uh, surfboards and wetsuits, and so... Uh, they split it up, and Billy and I bought the whole thing for the inventory and made Bill's, uh, 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 made Bev Morgan a third partner. And we got along great. There was just a, he's a neat guy, a great partner, and he's very successful now. He owns the uh, Kirby Morgan Company. <clears throat> and um, um, I remember the first day I, I was there, I sold a magazine for 15 cents. And it should have been 25 cents, so I lost 10 cents on the sale. And we were having uh, dinner at my mom's house, my wife and I and Bill and my mom and my grandmother. And she said, well, do you think this is a pretty good business? I loaned you $1,800 and you did 15 cents the first day. And I said, oh, I think it's going to be okay. And I remember we wanted to do, uh, 
we thought if we could get it up to a hundred dollars a day, you know, we, I worked two days there and I lifeguarded five days and I had my cleaning business going too and I was cleaning ponchos still at the time. So I had my hands full, you know, and my, my two days off from the lifeguards, I went down and worked the shop and you go, you go a whole day without ever seeing anybody in that place because diving is probably the worst business you could ever go into, less than one percent and they still do, don't dive, you know, I do dive. And uh, so um, uh, we just kept plugging away at it. We thought if we could get it up to a hundred dollars a day, it'd be a doggone good business. And uh, so one day we we uh, Morgan wanted to um, incorporate it. We started a corporation, and so we went up to see a famous lawyer up, and that we knew we'd taught him to dive and everything. And there was no certification in those days. We just taught people how to dive, and we would we made up our mind we wouldn't sell them equipment unless they knew how to dive, and, or we taught them. And we came, we're coming back, and I said, I think, he said, what do you think of this? And I said, I think it's really going to go now. And he said, well, I want out. And we just put a $5,000 uh, deposit on the building where the lifeguard service is, you know, that big building next to Dive and Surf. Mm -hmm. And we just bought 10 <clears throat> motors, and we bought a new truck, and, and uh, we had pretty good credit because we always paid our bills on time. And so uh, he says, I went out. And I said, wait a minute. And I says, you've did this before. Is this final? He says, I'm getting a divorce. I'm going around the world. He says, and so we went in and talked it over. And he says, here's, here's how much inventory. And I just want a third of it. He didn't have any money in, in, anyhow, you know, because he didn't have any money. So he wrote us out a check for the, the amount that he felt was fair and we felt was fair. And he signed the back of it and gave it back to us. And he says, now pay my alimony while I'm away. <laughs> So when Bill, Bill got out of the service, he said, boy, thanks for taking her off my hands. He said, if you ever get a divorce, I'll help you pay the alimony. I didn't say that, but I helped pay too. <laughs> and he's a neat guy, and he uh, traveled around, and he did uh, interview, uh, he did uh, stories on boats and stuff and diving all over the world, and then came back, and he wanted to get back in. And and uh, he was a kind of a moody guy, and he'd get, he'd get mad or something, and he'd leave for four or five days, and he'd come back, and he was out. And just like nothing happened, you know, and he threatened to quit many, many times. You guys can have the business. He'd go to Mexico and he'd come back and he'd just jump right back in there like nothing happened. I said, well, you know, this is final. And so when he got back on the trip, he asked if he could get back in the business. And boy, we'd struggled like heck for two or three years. And we had it going pretty good then, you know. We had a Boston Whaler dealership, Johnson Motors, and inflatables. We were doing everything to make money. And I said, I'll have to think about it. <laughs> and he never called me back. He felt it was unfair to do to, to ask to be back in the business, so he never did that. We remained friends all these years. And what year did you bring Dive and Surf to Redondo Beach? Uh, 1953. And yeah. is that the original building at That's, Broadway and Kevin? No, the uh, original building was um, right where, um, let's see, what, what store? Gold's Gym would be right across right across the street from there would be our business. So that was uh, Gold's Gym right now is on Harbor Drive at Pacific. Yeah, that was uh, J.C. Penney or some market. There was a... It was a drug store and then a big market and a bunch of little photo shops and t toy store in there. And um, that we was had the triangle where the right now where the big Crown Plaza Hotel is. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. between Pacific Burl and uh, Pacific Burl and Catalina. Yeah, and there was they called it the triangle, and yeah. so you were opposite that. Well, if, if you know where Gold's Gym is, yeah. and you look out toward the ocean, we were on the other side of the street. That was our little shop there. And we started out with one little building, and then we got it two, and then we got three, and then we got four, and then we got five. And I think we ended up with six buildings there. And two apart and we had kind of a, two apartments in the back where there were bedrooms and uh, bathrooms and stuff. And we actually, um, we actually built a build our fence across the city street there that they didn't use. And we thought, we'd claim adverse possession on this. <laughs> but we had a 30-day lease there from the Signal Oil Company, and that was it. And uh, so we finally absorbed the, the, we had a restaurant there, a guy, a, a, a polisher of brass and metals and stuff. And TV Tom was there, and we took over his building, and he just worked out of his home. And so we absorbed all those buildings, and that was dive and surf. And then all at once they said, we want our building back. We want to use this for something else, and so a friend of mine had he uh, had found a piece of land where we're at now, and he built that building for us, and uh, we moved in there. So you were on lease property for Signal, yeah, for Signal mm -hmm. Oil for for until 1958. And uh, was the downtown still there? Yeah, the downtown was there and everything. What year did uh, Redondo Beach's downtown go away? I think. Uh, <clears throat> Gosh, right after we left, it kind of it kind of fell apart. You know, they 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 well, they kind of got rid of all of that and redid the whole thing. The trading post moved, 
a few years after that. That was on Diamond, and I did some business with them because we were always needing things for repairs and stuff. Now, did you ever uh, support any of the, when they had used to have a gambling? The gambling ship was probably before you came here. Yeah, I, di I didn't know anything about What about, about the barge? Uh, there was a fishing barge there for many years. Yeah, we used, off. we used to dive around that. I used to go out there and, and uh, check for holes in it and stuff for them. Yeah. So did you do commercial diving as well? To, to well, we started out. Morgan never did, but um, right after he got out of the business, um, a, a guy a guy named Don Severich walked in the store and he says, uh, I want to build a submarine. And boy, listen, that was right up our alley. We wanted to build a submarine so bad. And so we just loaded him up with gear, and he helped us with our advertising and stuff. And he says, I couldn't believe you guys. He'll tell the story. He says, here, I, you didn't even know my name. And I walked out of the store with a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, we started diving together and everything. And and uh, years later, he, he got in around to start building a submarine. And he wanted to build a crawler, and we wanted to build a floater. And uh, we had rescued a 55-foot yawl called the Emerald off the breakwater. It sank. And Leonard Wibberley, the, uh, he's a, a write, he was a writer. He wrote The Mouse That Roared and The Mouse That On The Moon. And he was diving with us at the time. He was a very funny man, a great guy. And and he says, he says, I bought this boat for five hundred dollars. You guys want to go into business with me on it? And he just wanted to have the experience of raising it and writing a story about it. And he, he told the newspapers and stuff, it's going to be up at, at twelve noon on Tuesday. And he had no idea how to do it. none of us did. So we uh, we experimented with different things, and my brother came up and said, well, we'll lift it with inner tubes. And we'd heard about ping pong balls and everything. But on a sailboat, it's cambered like this, and so if you put inner tubes on the inside, it's going to blow the roof off. So we figured we had to put them on the outside. And so we bought this boat, and uh, it's funny, a funny story here. We went out there the first night, and uh, Leonard Wibberley and I were diving together, and it was nighttime, I think it was about nine o'clock and it went up that afternoon just went up on the outside of the breakwater and sank and uh and jack Wynn says he says see if the parrot's on board will you he said the dog got off but i don't know whether the parrot's on board see if he's in his cage and so we went down he was in his cage so we let him out of the cage and we told him he wasn't in the cage <laughs> just to make him feel good that it may have got way you know and so uh, he says and see if you can get the bible out of the four peak of the boat so I went up there, and, you know, Fort Peak's pretty small, and the hatch getting down there is a sliding hatch, slid it back, and I go down in there, and I get stuck. And there's nothing to grab a hold of because everything's floating up at the ceiling. You can't grab anything to push yourself out or get back in. And Leonard's pushing on me. He's trying to jam me down there farther. And I was about ready to drown, and I got to laughing so hard that this is really something I'm going to drown. I was an instructor at the time. And my number, my instructor's number is one, UICC. That's, that's the oldest club in the world. And uh, so I, thought, I started laughing, and, and water started coming in my mouth because I had a single hose radi regulator on the time. So I just turned it upside down. Now the, uh, the exhaust is in the right place. So I, I used to teach that to all my students and everything because it's a good exercise. And so finally I just relaxed, and I thought, well, maybe you'll pull me out thinking I'm dead. And that's what he did. And I felt this book, and I grabbed it. And he pulled me out and I put it up underneath my wetsuit and came up and, and we said, you know, there's some big holes in the ship and everything else. And he said, did you find the Bible? And I said, yeah. And I pulled it out and it was The, the Silent World by Cousteau. <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. But uh, we took, um, brought that up with inner tubes. First time anybody had ever brought anything out of the ocean with inner tubes. They usually used 55-gallon cans and these were perfect. Because Leonard says, it'll be up at noon on Tuesday. And so uh, it was overcast and raining. And we bought, uh, I think, 140 inner tubes because you figured that's how many we'd need. And we, we knew it had a 20,000-pound keel. And we could compensate for that. The wood would lift the machinery. And so we'd cut the mask off because we knew if it came to the surface, the big, heavy wooden mask would just fold over and fall again. So uh, we went, uh, <clears throat> we were diving and we figured we didn't have enough inner tubes, so I went and bought 50 more. We paid 50 cents a piece for them, used inner tubes, and we'd cut the valve core out of the inner tube, and we'd hook a, a piece of webbing around there with a hook on it, and we'd taken the chain from the anchor, and we'd made it all around the boat, made a cradle for it, and then we took the two sheet lines and put the anchors out on the stern and back and winched them up, so that when it came up, it'd draw it out from, from breakwater. And uh, I, I just... I'd, 
got their last five inner tubes at 140, and I was heading down, and Don pulled me to the surface. He says, put some on the stern. The bow's starting to bob up and down a little bit. And inner tubes every place. So we put some on the steering wheel and hooked some to the compass, the post, and and my brother and I, we'd, uh, we'd taken my mom's wash tub, and she was mad about it, and we cut four holes in it, and we tied it down in four places, and we'd come up underneath it, and that was our communication device. And I said, put more on the stern. The bow's starting to pop up and down. So we did. And we're probably the only two captains that ever come up with a boat instead of going down because all at once it got bright, and I thought the sunlight's coming out. And we were just standing in waist-deep water, and there we were. And it came up real slow like that. And we'd put the uh, the, the uh, valve core up high enough that it would only lift about 100 pounds, see. And so as it came up, it kept exhaling, and it just came up very, very slowly instead of rushing to the surface like crazy. Towed in inside the breakwater, and we took it down to Hanchett's. And they said they could repair it for $500. It was about 23000 I think. And Don is an expert at this stuff, so... Um, we used it to go to Catalina and we took students out on everything and um, my brother's wife just was terrified. She was like this and the bill was on there. When I just laying on the floor and she was just scared because the boat would lean over, you know, we'd bury the bear. So we said, we got to get a different boat. So we <laughs> sold that boat to Don and he never paid us for it. And then he sold it and never paid us for it. And he says, I want to I repair you. Why don't I just put that money into the submarine? You put more money in, you'll be partners with me. And so we did. What was the name of that boat, and how did it The take? Emerald. The Emerald. It uh, just went into Irons, and they, they wouldn't drop the anchor because it took them 58 minutes to raise the anchor by oh. ratcheting it up, and they just vowed they're never going to drop the anchor again, <laughs> and it just finally went right up on the breakwater. And the first day we took it out on our sailing expedition, the first maiden voyage, we got in Irons, and... Uh, they kept going, you're in your you're in My wife's driving. <laughs> We're trying to get the sails up. And Don says, I know how to sail. And we put the jib up upside down and everything else. It was a total fiasco. It was a nice sailing boat. It was built in 1924. But uh, it was a great boat. It's a boat that uh, one of the Beach Boys dove off of in Marina del Rey and drowned. He never came up. The same boat? Yeah, same boat, the Emerald. So how big is, how big is that boat? It's 55-foot yaw and weighed 60,000 pounds. So you, you actually rescued that off of yeah, the redundant off the bottom. break wall. Mm -hmm. yeah. You talked about the break wall being much smaller at one time and it being a lot shallower. Now, they had, they had extended it out at that time. But, yeah, there's just hardly any breakwater. You couldn't even hardly call it a breakwater. It's unbelievable. Now, did you have anything to do with placement of that or no. uh, diving? I, I've really not got involved with the city as much as I would have liked to. You know, I did a, I, I used to go around and give talks to dive clubs and, and uh, chamber of commerce and rotary club and stuff like that, but we never got involved in politics, and uh, I wish I had. I, I wish we would have been more involved in the city of Redondo. So what was your experience with storms through the years at Redondo and watching all the things that happened? I think well, I've one been of the in five north, northeasters at Catalina, and they're terrorizing to be in. <laughs> she knows about that. But they are really terrorizers to be in. You don't want to be around. And that's, they usually happen from November to February. But um, we, used to go, we used to go out diving all the time. But we'd go diving almost, I bet you, four or five times a week. And... Um, and we came in with some lobster and abalone. We would drop one guy off on the breakwater. He'd crawl up over the breakwater, and we had a key in, and then he'd get in the shower and open up the, the and take a shower and put on his clothes, and then we'd open up the shop, and the rest guys would be down the breakwater trying to get the boat out because there's no ramp or anything. And we just lay boards down or matting or something and get the boat out of the water there. And uh, one, one uh, experience, we had a little shower there, and it wasn't the code. You could just just barely get in and close the door. And you take your suit off like there's no zippers or anything. And Morgan put this great big shower head in there, beautiful shower head, and it had a lot of pressure. And you go like that, and I got this, my suit stuck in the shower head, and the material was really strong at the time. And here's the water coming up. <laughs> coming up to here, and I almost drowned in that shower. <laughs> I finally just sat way down on the, and ripped the suit and got the thing open. So you dive everywhere in the... At hundreds of feet. Yeah, and, and almost safe, drowned and in almost the shower. shower. Almost drowned in the shower. So, you know, some of you said that uh, about Abalone and Redondo Beach, when you go out there now, there's nothing. There's nothing, What was, yeah. what was the diving like in 1947? And there well, were you could go out and get your limit. I think the limit at one time was five, and we tried to tell the fish and game that that's way too many, you know. You're encouraging people to go out on a boat, a charter boat, and get enough game that they come back and they can feed their family and sell it and so you're you're promoting them 
to do an illegal thing to sell stuff. And the, the limit on lobster was 10. Well, you couldn't eat 10 lobsters, you know. I mean, we, we were catching them at 10, 15, 10 and 12 and 15 pounds. And so we tried to get that. But the commercial, I think the commercial divers and the lobstermen have taken just way too many. And sport divers really don't, they, they took a lot at one time, but they don't take that much anymore. And, uh, at the end, they finally lowered it to two, and the lobsters are seven. And it should be maybe three lobsters and dive, because it's just, it's just not good at all. This is the best lobster diving in the world right out here. It's just it's really? unbelievable, yeah. What part of what? Uh, what's the biggest lobster that you ever took? Uh, about a fourteen pounder. Mm -hmm. And yeah. where did you find that? Uh, you know where the dominator is. Yes. Right underneath the dominator. Before the dominator got there, there was a big cave. And Christmas Day, we caught seven of them. I think the the biggest was fourteen and a half pounds, and the smallest was twelve and a half pounds. And the dominator ran into the point at off of Palisades. Yeah, it said it hit a it hit a reef. It just ran up on the shore there. And uh, did you dive on that? After yeah, I was the first guy to dive on it. Uh, ben Morgan and I. I swam out as a lifeguard, and uh, we couldn't get on it. They didn't have enough uh, rope bladders to get down. And they finally rigged something, and then we went out there the next day on our own, and I got up on the ship, and Bev took some pictures of it. And uh, no, Don Severs took some pictures of it. And then it just started deteriorating after that. The Greek freighter, and it was just dirty as heck anyhow. You know, They hardly even had a compass on board. And uh, they have no navigation systems hardly at all. They went up on the fog, and they had weed on board. And um, they wanted to blow the weed up the hill, well, they first brought in barges, and that didn't work because it kept losing all the barges. Like, he lost one, two, three, four barges. One of them was as long as the, the, the boat itself. Mm -hmm. And um, so they wanted to, one guy got this idea, we'll, we'll blow it up the hill and put it in trucks in Powell's Village. Well, Powell's Village citizens didn't want trucks driving through their neighborhood, so it finally just deteriorated. And it'd be eight, ten feet deep on the bottom, you know. You, you, you'd go down to completely disappear in the wheat. In wheat? <laughs> yeah. And the fish were all eating it and everything. And uh, I remember Don Sieverts was married to a little Japanese gal. He still married to her. And she wanted to do uh, uh, ceramics, where she fired her own stuff. And they had some of these bricks on board. So we threw about 300 of these bricks overboard, and they float. And we were herding them all out toward this, and they started sinking. So we had to actually go down and dive for each one of them and put them back in the boat. And she built that, he built that, uh, what do you call it, a kill? Yes, kill. Yeah, kill. And uh, she did a lot of that after that. So I'm putting you on the spot here, but you probably know a different world of Redondo Beach than most people off the shore. Is there anything that's really interesting off of Redondo Shore to dive on that most people never see? The, uh, the canyon's an intriguing place. My first canyon dive with our submarine, we went down 70 feet, and uh, we have the batteries on the outside of the submarine, and it was a two-man. It w went to 1,000 feet. We, had it, and we, we figured it would make 1,000 feet. And so um, we, we were down at 70 feet, and everything went off, the lights, the motor, everything. No, and we had flashlights on the inside. So I didn't want to give up. I wanted to go diving. I wanted to go down deep in the canyon because I'm a shell collector and I wanted to find some. So the current was going south and I said, let's just bounce it down and we bounced it over and then we slid down the canyon wall like that. And uh, we get down about 250 feet and boy, I have some seashells I really want to get the manipulator arm. I'm starting to pick them up. And then all the mud that built up just fell on us and just covered us up completely, probably with 10 foot of mud. And we were just in total darkness, and you couldn't see this far. So our flashlights weren't any good or anything, so we just inflated and came to the surface. It was a kind of exciting dive for the first dive of a submarine I'd ever been in. And how deep have you gone off of Redondo? I've been uh, at, uh, at uh, Catalina. We uh, went down and found a diver at 178 feet, and we were down for about five and a half hours to the deepest depth of 535 feet. Now, my partner's been down to 1,000 feet a lot of times. Now, have you ever... Uh, dove on the the remains of the piers that are yeah. south of, mm -hmm. and what's that like? Well, that that's fantastic dive. You go out Pier 3, which is Sapphire, and uh, then it just shoots right on off. I took Gary Cooper and his wife and daughter there, and Charlton Hesson, and we uh, we found uh, a big Indian bowl, and we caught it, and I caught a turtle that day. And it was a kind of a sick turtle, and we took him out in Marineland and put him back in. The, they nursed him back to health and kept him there. So there were actually sea turtles there, uh, are there every, sea turtles now? Yeah, every once in a while you see a turtle, especially at Catalina at Johnson Rock. That seems to be a famous place for them, yeah. 
So how did you, you just mentioned a couple of people, Charlton Heston and Gary Cooper. Did you become known as somebody to go to to dive? Yeah, we had a great safety record. And our, our shop is probably the oldest uh, shop in the world originally owned dive and surf. And uh, I know Mel Fisher was in business before us, but it's been sold three or four times and Barry, Barry owns it now. And it's called CDC, but our shop is the original uh, dive shop. And it's kind of funny. Every every diver that I know, every guy shop owner I know, they don't dive anymore. And my brother and I, until just recently, I still dive an awful lot. Yeah, they That's just okay. get out of the sport. They make the they make it their hobby, their business, and it just destroys them. And it hasn't for me. I keep diving all the time. So when Gary Cooper came here to dive with you, um, did it? Did you do it quietly, secretly, or no? Did I didn't, people... didn't didn't get any have any publicity out at all because they were kind of low key people. They weren't high society or anything. She was. She called me up and she says, uh, she says, now my name is Rocky Cooper and we'd like to take diving lessons. And I said, well, okay. And then she said, well, how long did they take? And I said, well, it'll probably take, you know, once a week for six weeks. We taught a. At that time, we were teaching a, a real short course, and we always extended everything that anybody ever did. Our courses were the longest. We were the first ones to take people on beach dives and boat trips to Catalina and certainly you, you could get certified not even go in the ocean in those days. And before that, we didn't even certify people. We just taught them, and they're all, you know, they all lived happily ever after and didn't drown. And so she says, well, we don't have an awful lot of time. And I says, well, if you don't have time to take lessons, you don't have time to dive. And... And uh, so we were carrying on the conversation. Very nice gal. And, and uh, so uh, and she said, well, do you know somebody that teaches a one-class course? And I says, yeah. I says, take one from Mel Fisher. He teaches just one-class course and just wishes you goodbye because he, my wife bought my dive gear from him. And he just said, oh, just put it on. He can march out to 150 feet. You know? And uh, first time, I almost drowned right off Sapphire Street because it had a dry suit on it. It leaked. And uh, the old cartridge belt, you couldn't get them off real easy. It kind of had a big long spear gun, you kind of struggled back up and pole vaulted back up under the beach there. And so uh, she said, well, young man, we're going to buy an awful lot of equipment. I said, I don't care how much equipment you're going to buy. You're going to be taught to dive properly or you're not going to buy any equipment from me. I don't sell equipment unless they're certified. She says, I think you're the guy we want to talk to. And she <laughs> says, will you drive into Los Angeles? I said, nope, smog's too bad. When I, do, when I used to drive in there, I'd have a tank and a regulator and a faceplate. <laughs> this is a true story. I suffer terribly from asthma, and I can't stand smoke or anything. And she said, well, we don't live in Los Angeles. We live in Bel Air. And she says, are you married? And I says, yeah. And she says, well, bring your wife, and I think you'll have a good time. We'll have dinner, and you can teach us how to dive. So there was um, Charlton Heston, Mar Maria Cooper, their daughter, and Gary Cooper his, and his wife, and a gal named Skip Hathaway. She was uh, Henry Hathaway's... Uh, he did all of John Wayne's movies, and I taught them to dive in, in the pool. And the first time I met Cooper, he was washing his Bentley. He never let anybody wash his own car, and he never let people shine his shoes. And uh, when we were at the studio, he'd get a new pair of shoes, he'd put a knife there, at the blunt end of it, and he'd bend that back and forth so it had a nice even bend. And he never used cologne, he always used witch hazel. And he was a great guy, he's just the nicest man you ever met in your life. And and I'd get in, and when we did a movie together. Uh, well, I went on two or three vacations to Catalina. They want me to fly to Greece to them. I said I don't fly on airplanes. My wife doesn't like them either. I had a bad experience in the army with airplanes, and so uh, we went to Catalina on three beautiful vacations on John Wayne's yacht one time, and then they rented the Portola, which was used in Some Like It Hot, and uh, they uh, <clears throat> uh, we got over there, and and they didn't like. Uh, they didn't like sharks at all, and they all wanted to buy di diving knives, and I wouldn't sell them knives. He said, you don't need a knife. You're probably going to cut each other. And so we were diving, and I, they were scared of sharks, and so I found this big horn shark this long, and I grabbed him and held him in my arms, and they were petting him, and he's got a rasp. He can't, doesn't have teeth, and, you know, if he grabbed your finger, he'd pull the skin off, but he wouldn't be able to bite the bone or anything. And so they finished, and I was trying to get him used to sharks and stuff, and I spun him out there like that. And he turned around and came back and bit me in the shoulder here and just did these twirls and pulled about this much of my suit, wetsuit out of there. It didn't hurt my shoulder or anything. And I liked to never got him back in the water. And then uh, years, years after that, we did a movie together called Wreck of the Merry Deer. 
And I'd get in trouble with the unions every time. You know, I'd move rocks or move the camera or do this or do that. And so he says, come on. And he says, you're going to go in my trailer with me, and you can sleep on the couch, and I'm sleeping in the bed, and we'll hide out until they need us. And we had a good time on that movie. So what year did you teach Gary Cooper how to how to? How to uh, it had to be around 58 when we moved into the new building there. Yeah. So uh, I can't remember the name of the of the TV show with Lloyd Bridges. But I taught have... him to dive after he did that. We built all his suits. Ivan Torres called us up and he said, we're going to do this movie about diving. And I said, I think it'll really be a success. But I said, you got to make sure you get some technical advice on it and do it properly. And so the, the one, the, the film they showed us, it had a lot of mistakes. And he says, oh, maestro, he says, don't worry about it. There's just one percent. I says, I know there's only one percent of the people who dive. I'm in that business. He says, they're not going. Who cares? They're not going. Well, they had so many complaints about it that years later they had to go back and correct a lot of the stuff before they showed it in reruns and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Lloyd Bridges came down and we were building him in a new wetsuit. And um, he says, your brother said you'd jump in the pool with me and show me some things. And I said, like what? And he said, well, I don't know how to dive. And I said, well, you've been, you've did this series for years. He said, he never taught me how to dive. I just walked walk down the ladder and come up the ladder. And he says, that's all I ever did. And I said, well, you want to learn? Oh, I said, you want to learn how to take a breathe out of a tank or cut a hose off or something? No, I just want to learn how to clear a faceplate and learn how to dive. So I taught him and his uh, two kids, Jeff and Bo. And uh, he's the nicest man you ever met. But we'd build him a suit. And... Uh, my my uh, nephew is same size as he was, and we'd stand him out there, not Lloyd, but my my nephew, and we'd put his arms on two poles and have him stand there, and we'd clean him off with tiling because it had a powder on it, and then we'd paint this glue, this gray glue, we we developed it, and we'd paint that all over him, and so he'd have to stand there for about an hour and a half, and then we'd throw tar talcum powder at him, and that kept it from sticking to each other. And Ivan Torres, he didn't want to pay the $100 to paint that suit, so they did it themselves. They didn't ask how to do it. And they painted it on him, and then he put his hands down like this and said, oh, it was just glued right there. So they had to cut the suit off. I came back and said, okay, you guys build the suit and paint them for us now. <laughs> so people was, tried to imitate what you did, but they didn't yeah, know the secret. Yeah, they didn't know the secret. But uh, that was a very successful show. I used to ask everybody when they came in the class, where did you find out about diving, word of mouth, or advertising? And the majority of them would put uh, a Sea Hunt. Oh, he, what, what, what really got him into diving, though, I mean, where he actually dove, he went to the Boston Sea Rovers, which was a huge dive club, still is. And so after his talk, he went to his hotel room, and they said, we want you to go diving with us tomorrow. He said, well, I'm flying out. And he said, well, then go night diving with us. He said, I had to get sick right on the spot. I'm not going to go night diving. <laughs> he couldn't dive at all. But he was a nice man, very nice guy. So did you ever do anything for the military? Uh, we went down and we sold the military the first wetsuits, custom-made wetsuits. And Bill and I went down and measured up 100 guys. And we got a, a, a wetsuit order for $10,000. And that was the biggest thing we'd ever did. So yeah. prior to that, they were pretty much into dry suits and the dry in the suits and the stock suits and yeah. helmet. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember one of the commanders, Eric, says, "My my name isn't on the list." I said, "Well, I don't see it on there." He said, "Well, I want a wetsuit." And I said, "We'll be glad to build you a wetsuit." But I said, "And you know, you had to sign a thing. It really said you didn't do anything favorite for anything to get the bid and stuff." And so I says, "We'll build you a wetsuit, but we want it back in six months. We want you to log each dive, and and we're we're giving you an experimental wetsuit." And we want it back, and we want information about it. He said, I'm not going to do that. And I said, well, then you're not going to get a wetsuit. And I never got another bid either. <laughs> that was the end of our military contract. <laughs> well, it's probably been much nicer dealing with people. Oh, yeah. And how many people do you think that you and Dive and Surf have taught through the years? Oh, gosh, I have no idea. Maybe 20,000. And do, do, do people ever come back and talk to you about the experiences? or? Oh, yeah. You? yeah. They call me up all the time. Says, is there an old friend down here at the shop? Can you come down and uh, uh, talk to him? And so I run down and talk to him. I uh, had a burial at sea with Dick Keeler, and he's, uh, the Keeler family is pretty famous in Redondo. And uh, his dad was uh, struck by lightning in, uh, in San Francisco, and the guy next to him died. And then he got struck again in lightning in Keno Bay on the roof of his house. And his son was walking down the avenue to go lifeguarding, and he got struck on the uh, Esplanade there at Avenue C, and it just when he took his hat off, just a ring of skin came off, and then he never grew any more hair there. And I just saw him, 
And uh, he was uh, Reagan's trainer at the White House, and Nixon, and, and uh, Ford, and uh, 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 President Bush.